Today I'd like to talk to you about the joy of the Holy Spirit. The joy of the Holy Spirit. You know, we always say the joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, the joy of the Lord is the same as the joy of the Holy Spirit. They're one and the same. And we're going to see this as we go through the uh, Advent story as it is revealed in Luke. So let's, we're going to start at Luke 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And that was Mary's cousin. Verse 6. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. Do you see a running theme here? All throughout scripture, we see barren women, God using barren women to accomplish his will here on the earth. Verse 6 tells us that they were both righteous in the sight of God. Does that mean they were sinless? No. Does that mean they did everything perfectly? No. What it means is that they had the desire to please God and they did all they could to be sure that they did the things that pleased God. They were righteous and blameless, keeping the commandments and the requirements of the law. And what was the requirement? That offerings would be made for their sin representing the Messiah that would come to die for their sins. So we're able to see they were not sinless, but they were faithful to ask forgiveness and to seek the forgiveness of God as they lived. Let's go to verse eight. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot, meaning providentially, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So here we have, the, according to the order of priests, he was chosen by casting lots. Well, that would seem he was chosen by chance. God does nothing by chance. It looked like chance, for him, they cast lots and whoever the lot came upon, it fell to him. Now, this was a great opportunity, a great opportunity. Why? One commentary says this was a once in a lifetime opportunity because of the large number of priests. Most would never be chosen for such a duty and no one was permitted to serve in this capacity twice. The incense was kept burning perpetually just in front of the veil that divided the holy from the most holy place. Now, the chosen priest would offer the incense every morning and evening while the people, the rest of the priests and the other people worship and stood outside the holy place. So we see this. They cast lot. Here comes Zacharias', Zacharias name. He goes in thinking, well, you know, this happened. But uh, I'm going to tell you something. When God has an appointment with you, he will make sure you're where you need to be. And he's always on time. Amen. Amen. We look at verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were in, were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. I love how specific the word of God is. He didn't say he just showed up. He's standing to the right of the altar of incense. He's standing there. To the right was considered a place of authority and of power. And he's standing to the right of the incense, which represents the prayers of the people. Verse 12. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. That's an understatement. You have all these people running around here talking about they have encounters with angels and they did this and God did this. I want to tell you something. If they did not shake with fear when they saw the angel, they didn't see an angel. I'll say that again. If they didn't shake with fear when they saw the angel, they didn't see an angel. Because even John, the revelator, who was filled with the Holy Spirit of God, he even trembled and bowed down when he saw the angel of God. 
You see, God, we are the children of God. But just like my daddy used to tell me, I'm not one to be trifled with. Amen. He's not our buddy. He's not the man upstairs and his messengers aren't either. We don't control them. God controls them and they are in the sight of God. That means they are more perfect than we are. Amen. So you hear people talking flippantly about these angels. Just ignore them. Again, verse 12. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. And he called him by name, Zacharias. For your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. Again, again, we see just as the, the angel said to Mary, he came to her and said, look, your prayer has been answered, but Mary wasn't praying for anything. He told him, he told Zacharias, this is how it is, and this is what's going to happen. The very same thing he did for Mary. He said, this is how it is. You are favored, and you will do this. So he told him, you're going to name the boy John. Not only you tell him the name, but he told him the sex of the child. Amen. It would appear from this passage, passage that Zacharias did not cease petitioning God for his wife to conceive, even though they were advanced in age. Now, that's some faith. Sometimes we fall short of asking God because we think, oh, that's, that's impossible. I, 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 I don't know how that's going to happen. You know what? You keep on praying because it's not up to us. We keep on praying because it is an, it is an expression of our faith. Verse 14 of Luke 1. You will, this is what the angel said, you will have what? Joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great. Not might, not maybe. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, being that he will take the Nazarite vow, just as Samson. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Let me say that again. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. <laughs> in this passage, we see the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit and we see the joy of the Holy Spirit, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Holy Spirit. The sovereignty is this. The baby would be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb without his consent. Isn't that what it says? The Holy Spirit doesn't need our consent to fill us. This is right here in scripture. He said in the womb, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He didn't pray all night. He didn't try to figure it out. God told him, God predetermined that this baby will be filled with the Holy Spirit and he will turn people back to God. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit did the same thing to you? He didn't wait on your stubborn will and my stubborn will. He didn't wait until we decided and saw, well, you know, I guess, Lord, I, got, I guess I want you. These people say, well, they can wait till they're on their deathbed to, to invite God in their hearts. That's not true. That's not true because that's your intent. You have no intentions of accepting God. Now, people can be saved on their deathbed just as the thief on the cross. He said he heard the message and he received the message and he was saved. But he didn't go up and say, well, you know, I guess when it's the last time I'm going to. No, we don't play with God like that. And what is the joy of the Holy Spirit? The baby would do exactly what the Holy Spirit does. That is lead people to God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And what is the joy of the Lord? Saving his people. That's the joy of the Lord. He takes joy in saving his own. Therefore, the Holy Spirit would fill this baby so that he could do and accomplish the joy of the Lord by bringing many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Now, the joy of the Lord is not something, the joy of the Holy Spirit is not something 
we, for which we ask. It is granted to whomever the Holy Spirit chooses according to the will of God. We see this in Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated or set you apart for my use. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Did Jeremiah have a choice? No. God said this is what's going to happen. He told this, this, this is how it is. This is who you are. And this is what's going to happen. It sort of gets rid of man's free will, doesn't it? Amen. <laughs> Paul said this about himself in Galatians 1.15. But when God, who has set me apart, meaning chose and concentrated, consecrated him, even from where? My mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him amongst the Gentiles. Again, before he even showed up, God planted. Now, wasn't Paul a persecutor of the church? Paul is a classic example of one of God's lost sheep who had goat tendencies. He was always one of God's sheep, but he was a lost sheep. Just like you, you were always one of God's sheep, but you were a lost sheep. So he came to save you in the right time, at the appointed time, just as he met with Zacharias, he met with you. The Holy Spirit came upon you, opened your ears, your eyes and your mind. And you said, oh, I want Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful thing. And how, Dana, how do you know that? Romans 8, 29. For those he foreknew, that doesn't mean those he looked down the corridors of time and knew he would choose him. No, he looked down the corridors of time and chose people. For those who he foreknew, meaning he predestined to favor, he also predestined or chose, set apart, and consecrated for what? To become conformed to the image of his son so that he, Christ, would be the firstborn or preeminent one among many brethren. Jesus Christ was not born, but he is called the firstborn because the firstborn was the preeminent child in, the, in that economy. And the one who was firstborn got the birthright, as we saw in the Old Testament. So before you were born, God knew you. And he called you to be conformed to the image of his son. Aren't you glad he did that? Back to Luke 1, verse 18. Zacharias said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is, in, is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, he said, oh, don't get this twisted. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Enough said. He continued, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. I just want to say this. Good news is good news whether or not it's received as good news. Good news is good news whether or not it's received as good news. Because this good news was about the will of God and the will of God is always good. Therefore, God is not waiting for us to accept it for it to be good news. It's going to be good. Why? Because he's going to do what he's going to do with or without us. Now, in the middle of this supernatural encounter, Zacharias allowed human reasoning, not faith, to control him. He allowed his human reasoning. Now, I want to say this. There is nothing. We saw that he was blameless, right? That he was blameless. He and Elizabeth were blameless and they, and they were blameless in the sight of God. There is nothing anyone favored by God can do to separate themselves from the love of God. Nothing. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. But there are things we can do to cause God to express his love as discipline. Remember, discipline is part of the love of God. 
We will, he will never be removed from his love, but his love is also joy and, 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 and praise and, and blessings, but it's also discipline. Verse 20 of Luke 1. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. <laughs> God's going to do it with or without us. Now, I've heard, I growing up, I heard people preach, God had to shut them up because if he spoke a negative, negative confession, it wouldn't happen. That's a lie. That's a lie. That, that, say, that No, 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 no. God does not need our permission to do one single thing. If we can stop the will of God by our puny faith, then God himself is puny. And I'm here to tell you, God is almighty. He's almighty God. Didn't Jesus come to this world without your permission? Did he not live a sinless life without our faith? Did he not go to the cross even when his disciples didn't believe he did all of that and he rose again on the third day without our faith amen, amen. oh oh I forgot the beginning in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth the sea and all that in the midst he created all that and nobody was around so you're going to try to tell me that he had to shut him up because he would speak negative things. And if he spoke negative things, it wouldn't happen. Oh, no, that, oh, no, 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 no. These are people who think that they think that we are in control of God. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, God is in control of everything, including you and including me. And when he decides to discipline us, he does it for his glory. He says, shut your mouth. I'm going to do it. Just get over in the corner. Get in time out. Because this is going to happen without you. But what, the result of discipline is always the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Because when the baby was born and people said, what are you going to name him? Name him. Elizabeth said, John. And people said, there's no one in your family named John. And they turned to Zacharias. He said, <laughs> and he wrote out the name John. And when he wrote the name John, he was able to speak. And all the people knew it was the working and the discipline of God. God was glorified even through his discipline. And God is glorified even when he disciplines us. Amen. Now, while in the room, in the womb, John exhibited, the baby exhibited the joy of the Holy Spirit when Mary went to visit his mother. Verse 44, Luke 1. Elizabeth said, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Why? Remember, Gabriel told Zacharias, this baby will be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. <laughs> the baby filled with the Holy Spirit was able to recognize Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit we are able to recognize Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's only by the work of the Holy Spirit. And when you came into the presence of Jesus and when you realized that your sins could be forgiven, when you realized you were no longer under the wrath of God, what happened? What came into your heart? I guess some joy, wouldn't it, didn't it? And what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love. Come on, what's the second one? Love, joy, and what? Peace. He gives you the gift and he causes you. And you know what happens when you get around another brother or sister who's filled with the Holy Spirit? What happens when you start having a conversation? You get a little excited, don't you? You jump. You're not in the womb, but you're still jumping. Hey, Amen. You're still leaping. Why? You leap for joy because you're able to converse with one another. That's why even through the storms we went through, we need each other to encourage one another. Even though we face loss, we remind each other of the promises of God and the Holy Spirit in you identifies with the Holy Spirit in your brother and your sister and you're able to rejoice together with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, there was another man, I'll close with this. There was another man who experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit. Luke 2, verse 25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit 
was upon him. Now this is before Pentecost. This is before Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is not new. He was their creation and he worked throughout the whole Old Testament. Remember, the book of Luke is a continuation of the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus had not shed his blood to ratify the new covenant. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all a part of the old covenant. So the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. He was righteous. Why was he righteous? Because the Holy Spirit was upon him. There's no one righteous apart from God. Verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, meaning the anointed one. Verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the, in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, meaning to be circumcised, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, remember, he's in the Holy Spirit now and he's about to bless God. He said, verse 29, now, Lord, you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace according to your words. In other words, my joy is complete. I'm done. Lord, you did what you said you're going to do. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Verse 31, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Here's a question for you. Why was Simeon able to see that this baby was the savior of the world? What was it? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled him to see Jesus for who he really was and who he is, even though he was clothed in the flesh of a baby. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're lies. He said, no, who do you say that I am? He said, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And who did the Father in heaven use to reveal this? The same one he uses all the time, the Holy Spirit. You see, you, see, you, you understand? How, the reason why I'm doing this so you can understand. When someone tries to tell you, well, you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can tell them you're lying. How do I know I have the, I know I have the Holy Ghost because I know who Jesus is. And most importantly, he knows me. After that, Simeon declared the gospel. Whenever we see in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit poured out. What they always did was declare the mighty works of God. And that's exactly what Simeon did. Verse 32, he called Jesus, this baby, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The Holy Spirit causes us to see who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit takes joy in revealing Christ to those God wills to know him through his son. Didn't, didn't Jesus say, I will send you another comforter and he will guide you to all truth? Well, who is the truth? Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit points us to Christ. That's why I say, if you're around a lot of people who are talking about the Holy Ghost all the time, they got it out of place. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is not for us to focus on him. It's the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to get us to focus on Christ. If you're looking at the gifts, if you're always looking at all that stuff, that's not it. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to cause us to be bold in Christ, to declare who he is, even when we are faced with the greatest opposition. He takes joy in that. Now, when the truth is revealed to us, we rejoice. Though we have never seen him, we see that Simeon saw him. Have you ever seen him? Have you ever seen Jesus? No, he's not walking around in the flesh. But I have some great news of great joy for you. First Peter one verse eight says, you love him though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, 
you believe in him. How? Huh? By the creative work of the Holy Spirit in, in you, according to the will of God, by grace through faith. And because of that, and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Verse 9, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And what is that? Salvation from the presence of sin. Jesus Christ is going to come again. And he's going to... Match your soul with a renewed body. Your soul is already saved. Your soul, your soul, your soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. But it's messed up, way messed up with my body. <laughs> Amen? It's not well with our bodies. I tell you, I don't want someone in here to tell you about a knee that didn't work. You ever go this way, your knee want to go that way? You ever wake up and you didn't do anything, but you wake up and you're just about in traction when you get off the mattress? You ever turn too fast and the world keeps moving? You, 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 you ever get headaches and wonder why you get headaches? And then your feet hurt and the barometer changes and your body is just all messed up. And then you got to fight the flesh and the spirit. You got to fight the flesh. We were not saved so our bodies would be all right here. We were saved so our souls could be right so that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and we will live forever with the Lord. And the joy of the Holy Spirit will be ours forever. Do you have the joy of the Holy Spirit this morning? I know you do. I know you do because you're looking for Jesus. You're looking for Jesus to come. And only those who are filled with the Holy Spirit are looking for Jesus to come. Not only that, you enjoy being in the fellowship of other believers. Only those who are filled with the Holy Spirit enjoy being around other people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you don't mind sitting in a slightly hot room listening to someone talk about Jesus and you're trying to fight sleep. Amen. <laughs> But you still endure. Why? Because you love the Lord. Because you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy in knowing that he saved you through Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we see him face to face, we too will say, My joy is complete. Father, we thank you for joy unspeakable. We thank you, Lord, that the joy that was experienced throughout all the ages is ours today. We thank you, Lord God, that, that, that even, things, even though things get hard in this life and we face the trauma of life, your joy is consistent because the joy isn't about us. It's about you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your joy is our strength. And we recognize that by the power of your Holy Spirit. We recognize and say that Jesus is Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that by the same power that saved us, that you will save those who do not know you. Lord, we do not manipulate people into serving you, but Lord, may we declare that Jesus is the only way to escape the wrath to come. May they hear your voice. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, save them that they may be counted in your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.